Hi, my name's Dave and I work with PACE, teaming up with local Christians to visit local schools to help everyone explore the Christian faith and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We do lots of lessons, lunchtime clubs and assemblies in primary schools and secondary schools in Bournemouth, Paul and Christchurch. And we have a lot of fun helping people ask and explore the answers to some of the biggest questions that there are. This lesson is about one of those big questions that people ask. What happens when I die? Is this life it or is there something more? By the end of this lesson, you should be able to do the following things. Name and describe some of the main theories there are about what happens when we die. Describe what Christians believe about who gets to live with God forever and how this can be misunderstood too. Explore what Christians mean by heaven and hell and what the Bible says about this. And have your own opinions and questions about what happens when we die. People say all sorts of things about what happens when we die. Good old Cartman from South Park says, what awaits each person in heaven is eternal bliss, divine rest and $10,000 cash. What do you think? What happens when we die? Where do we go? Pause the video now to have a think or a chat about this and jot down your thoughts. There are a whole range of beliefs out there about what happens when we die. Here are some of the main ones. Extinction. This is a name that's given to the view that we simply stop existing when we die. This is what atheists and humanists would say because they don't believe there's any kind of God or afterlife. Universalism is sort of the opposite view. It says everyone goes to heaven in the end. There are various people who believe this and when someone dies, they'll be confident that they've gone to a better place. Reincarnation says that we come back to pay our way. If we lived a good life before, we might come back as a human being with freedom to enjoy. But if we lived a bad life last time round, we might come back as a bug or a rat and have to work our way up from there. Purgatory says that we go somewhere else to pay our way before advancing to heaven. This is a Catholic church teaching, and there are many from the Catholic tradition who believe this, but it's not taught in the Bible. And there's heaven and hell. Lots of people believe good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. Some people believe that if their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, then they've done enough. They've earned their place in heaven with the good ones. Christians actually believe none of these views truly describe what happens when we die. All Christians basically believe four things. We believe God loves us and created us to know him, be like him and enjoy him forever in a world free from sickness, suffering and death. We believe we've been made for more, made for life with God forever. But we believe we all sin. We do things we should be ashamed of. These things break the relationship we were made to have with God, divide us from him and have brought sickness, suffering and death into the world he made. We believe that Jesus came as God's only solution for our sin problem, to live without sin, die in our place on the cross, and that he rose from the dead. We believe he did this for us, to take responsibility for all the wrong choices that we've made. And we believe that everyone has a choice to make about Jesus. Will I trust him to rescue me from my sin problem that divides me from God, so I can be forgiven and with God now and forever in a world without sickness, suffering and death? Or will I say no? Christians everywhere would generally agree with these four things and say that trusting and following Jesus is what gives them forgiveness and their relationship with God, both now and forever. So what do you think Christians actually believe about heaven and hell then? Perhaps you've already heard Christians say different things about this, or maybe you've picked up some ideas about it from Family Guy or other shows that make fun of Christians. Pause the video again. What do you think Christians actually believe about heaven and hell? And when we come back, we'll explore this together. C.S. Lewis, the author of the Narnia stories like The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, was a Christian who had lots of atheist friends who didn't believe what he did. One of them one day asked him, so what can Christianity give me that I can't find anywhere else? Lewis answered quickly with just one word, forgiveness. Christians believe everyone needs it 
and that this is the difference between those who get to live with God forever and those who don't. It's not about good people and bad people. Think about it this way. Imagine a graph that shows how good or bad people are. We could plot Hitler on there and he'd be way low on the graph. We could plot Mother Teresa on there or other great examples of compassion and selflessness and they'd be higher on the graph. We could plot ourselves on the graph and we'd probably be somewhere in between the best and the worst human beings who've ever lived. Sometimes people think that what Christians believe is that God draws some kind of horizontal line across this graph to decide who gets to live with him in heaven and who doesn't. But this isn't the way the Bible describes it at all. Think about it. God would be fairly petty and picky when it came to those who were quite close to the horizontal line. One person might just scrape in because of one final act of goodness before they died, and so they go to heaven. But someone else told one too many lies and then got hit by a car or something and died, and they dip below the horizontal line and God says, hell for you. No, Christians don't believe this. He doesn't divide good people, bad people with a horizontal line. It's more like he draws a vertical line and says to some, you guys needed my forgiveness, some more than others, but you all came to me and trusted Jesus who died for you. And so, yes, you're forgiven. You can be with me forever. And to others, God says, you guys needed my forgiveness too, some more than others, but you didn't want it. You didn't want me or a mended relationship with me. And so I can't force you to want my love and you can't be with me forever. Instead, you'll receive no more and no less than exactly what you deserve for your sin. So you might think you're a good person and compared to some other people, maybe you are. But compared to God, Christians believe there are no good people. No one who doesn't need forgiveness from God. The words heaven and hell mean different things to different people. Even Christians who read and study the Bible will have slightly different ideas in their heads about exactly what heaven and hell are. Some Christians think that hell is literally a lake of fire where people consciously suffer forever and ever. Others think that these pictures in the Bible are just ways of trying to describe how awful it will be to be completely separated from God. But all Christians would agree that basically heaven is about being with God forever and hell is about being without God forever. And all Christians agree that forgiveness from God through Jesus is what enables a person to live with God forever, not being a good person or being super religious. Christians have different ideas about the details of heaven too. Have a look at this brilliant clip from the Bible Project, which describes what the Bible says about heaven and earth. So in the Bible, the ideas of heaven and earth are ways of talking about God's space and our space. So I understand our space really well. We live here, there's trees, rivers, mountains. But my understanding of God's space gets a little fuzzy. And what we do get in the Bible are images trying to help us grasp God's space, which is basically inconceivable to us. So these are two very different types of spaces. Yes, they're, they're different in their nature, but here's what's really interesting is that in the Bible, these are not always separate spaces. So think of heaven and earth as like different dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. So we talk a lot about going to heaven after we die, but this idea of heaven and earth overlapping, we don't talk a lot about that. Which is kind of crazy because the union of heaven and earth is what the story of the Bible is all about. How they were once fully united and then driven apart and about how God is bringing them back together once again. So let's go back to the beginning where heaven and earth, they're completely overlapping. Yeah, this is what uh, the Bible's description of the Garden of Eden is all about. It's a place where God and humanity dwelt together, perfectly no separation, and, and humans then partner with God in building a flourishing, beautiful world and so on. But as humans, we wanted to do things a different way. We wanted God out and we wanted to create a world apart from him. Yeah, so we have these two spaces now. And the Bible actually uses lots of different kinds of words and phrases to refer to these two spaces to make a, a clear distinction. So you've said that these spaces can overlap though. So explain how that works. Yeah, this is where we have to start talking about temples. Because in the biblical world, you experience God's presence by going to a temple. That's where heaven and earth uh, overlap. 
Now, there are two types of temples described in the Bible. One is a tabernacle, basically a tent that was built by Moses. And the other was this massive building made by Solomon. And these temples were decorated with fruit trees and flowers and images of angels and all kinds of gold and jewels and so on. And these are designed to make you feel like you're going back to the garden. And at the center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was like the hot spot of God's presence. Now we can go and be with God again. But not so fast, because the temple also creates a problem. So God's space is full of his presence and goodness and justice and beauty, but human space is full of sin and injustice and the ugliness that results. So how do these spaces overlap if they're so different and they're in conflict with each other? This was resolved through animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's kind of weird. What do animal sacrifices have to do with this? Yeah, the the idea is this. Animal sacrifices, somehow they absorb the sin when the animal dies in your place. And it creates a clean space, so to speak, where you are now free to enter into the temple and be in God's presence. Okay, so if I'm an Israelite and I live in Jerusalem, I might be able to be in God's presence. But you said the story of the Bible is all of heaven and earth reuniting. Right. So we have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now, this word dwelling is really curious. Literally, it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around, hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. But a lot of people are threatened by Jesus and they kill him, which seems to spoil this whole plan to reunite heaven and earth. But we we have to go back to a scene earlier on in Jesus' story where John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus isn't just talked about as being a temple. He's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so, so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited like animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading and spreading and reuniting more and more of heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus. Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament, we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the Bible's story. The focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So in the book of Revelation, we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap once again. The Bible describes it this way in a vision a man named John had of what heaven will be like. He writes, I heard a loud voice from the throne. It said, look, God now makes his home with the people. He will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death and there'll be no more sadness. There'll be no more crying or pain. Things are no longer the way they used to be. He who was sitting on the throne said, I am making everything new. What do you think about what Christians believe about heaven? About who gets to live with God forever and what that will be like? Pause again. Now, to think and discuss and write down what you've learned and what you think about it too. Jesus told lots of stories to teach people about being in God's kingdom family, or in other words, about living with God forever. One of these stories is about two sons who are lost in different ways. I wonder which of them you identify with the most. Jesus said, 
There was once a dad with two sons. The younger son said to the dad, I don't want you, I just want your money. I can't wait till you're dead, so give me my inheritance now. He didn't even say please. Amazingly, the dad generously does what the younger son asks for. The son takes the money, leaves home, and ends up blowing it all on partying and everything else. He runs out of money eventually, and then runs out of friends, and winds up getting a job on a farm feeding the pigs. He's hit rock bottom. Then Jesus says, he eventually comes to his senses. He thinks, I know, I'll go back home to dad. He'll never have me back as a son, but he might at least let me have a job, and then I'll have a roof over my head and food in my stomach. So he set out home. All the way home, he's rehearsing the speech he's got for his dad. I'm so sorry, dad. I've sinned against heaven and against you. Please, I'm begging you, would you give me a job? When he finally reaches home, his dad has been looking out for him every day, longing to see him return. And when he realizes that this is the day, he runs to his son and flings his arms around him to welcome him back. The son starts his little speech, but dad interrupts him and says, we need to celebrate. We're inviting everyone. Come on, son. I love you. Welcome home. I'm so glad to have you back. Meanwhile, the older brother, who had been working out in the fields, hears the noise of the party. And when he finds out what his dad has done for his younger brother, he gets angry. He has a right old go at his dad. I've been working all these years for you, he says, and you've never given me anything. Then this useless son of yours comes home and you give him even more than you've given him already. How dare you, Dad? I deserve it all and you're giving it to him. The dad says, son, I love you, but we had to celebrate. Your brother was lost and now he's found. It's like he was dead and now he's alive again. And that's it. Jesus' story ends there. He doesn't tell us what the older brother does next. Does he call off, apologise and join the party? Or does he stay angry and not go in? We just don't know. And the point of Jesus' story is to make us wonder about what we will choose to do. Jesus is saying that God is like the dad in the story, loving, outrageously generous, patient, kind, forgiving. And we're like his kids, lost. We'd rather have the father's stuff than the father's heart. Some of us feel undeserving, like the younger son. We feel like if there's a God, we're not good enough for him and he'd never have us back. We might think God could never love someone like me. And Jesus is saying, you're wrong about that. You can come home and be forgiven. Others of us might feel deserving, like the older son. We feel like if there's a God, we're too good for him, if anything. We're certainly good enough without him. And if there's a God, we might think, God, you owe me. And Jesus is saying, you're wrong about that. You need to come home and be forgiven too. What do you think about Jesus' story, about what he's saying about God and each of us? Which of the two sons do you most identify with? Do you feel deserving or undeserving and why? And what do you think Jesus would say to you? Pause once more and think about or discuss this story that Jesus told. What do you make of it? I think Jesus was a master storyteller and a brilliant teacher. This story shows us why Christians today don't believe good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. We believe God has a load of silly kids who'd rather have his stuff than his heart. Some who feel deserving, others who feel undeserving. And we believe that because of Jesus, anyone can come home and be forgiven so they can live with God now and forever in a world without sickness, suffering and death. We believe we've been made for much more than we see and experience right now. I hope this lesson has helped you then in your studies and helped you with your own big questions too. Well done, I'll see you soon.